I hope that people are going to be able to use the Whova platform to chat with each other. Um, this is going to be a challenge otherwise. So this might be a little bit of a shorter session because a big chunk of this <laughs> was about a very small amount of ideas and a whole lot of people talking to each other because um, that's what we typically do. So we're going to um, go through this a little bit. And so maybe we'll do a little bit of quiet reflection. We'll see if we can do a little bit of writing in the um, chat box and um, we'll kind of go from there. Uh, the thing I would like everybody to start um, as we think about this from the beginning, because um, we're going to talk, just introduce a few ideas of justice. And then I'm curious to let people think about how they're seeing that play out um, where you are. Um, is just to begin this conversation by thinking about um, uh, somebody who introduced the idea of justice to you, um, probably when you were younger, and what it is that they taught you. Um, okay, and so if we can do that, transition to the Whova chat platform, um, be sharing in there, um, uh, really curious kind of what people were taught about the idea of justice as kids that you kind of still carry with you today. Um, for a topic that we talk about all the time and is language everywhere, um, we don't always examine our own experiences with it. So we'll start there um, and try and get some introductions going that way. All right, so we're going to give everybody just a minute or two to make that happen. Right. As we come back, I hope everybody has this idea in your head um, about where things started uh, for you and where some of these ideas, what's informed some of your thinking about this in the past. Um, right, Because justice is a word that gets used in so many different contexts into so many different meanings. Um, and very often as we try and then talk to each other about justice, um, not having shared definitions of it um, and having really different expectations and experiences of what it means can be a challenge as we start to try and sort through um, uh, relationally what justice means. Um, and we're going to look at a couple of definitions today, but I think that's one of the things I would have you keep in mind from the start is that justice is often a relational concept right? and it's often a um, uh, process concept rather than end result concept, right? And so those are two of the big uh, kind of differentiation points that we often see in, in conversations about this um, are about process versus outcome, right? And sort of relationship versus individual. All right, so let's jump into some slides. We'll start there um, and we'll keep trying to figure out ways to chat with each other in doing this. Um, all right, so let's do some, let's do some slides to get going. So hi, everyone. <laughs> My name's Braden Painter, uh, and I am the uh, Director of Methodology and Practice at the International Coalition of Sites of Conscience. Um, we are a network of museums, historic sites, places of memory around the world. Um, and what brings us all together is a belief that our historic sites have a uh, role to play in building more just, humane, and sustainable world. 
um, and that our sites are also much better when we do that connected with each other. Um, as I said before, I see a lot of good friends and uh, members and allies and coworkers and colleagues on the call already and lots of other people. Um, I'm sad that we are in a format that doesn't let us connect uh, as directly with each other. Um, when we're in the coalition, we think that as folks try and make change around the world, we try and make sure that people have access to the information and the skills that they need to do that, but crucially that people have access to the relationships um, that they need to do that too. We find that it is relationships that power the change that people try to make. All right, so this is a little bit about who we are, right? Founded about 20 years ago, um, right? We're here to connect past and present and work at that intersection of the tool, the two, as we try and move folks towards action. Um, all right, let me update this. And uh, I am coming to you today from um, Western Abnaki land um, in Southern Vermont. So as folks are doing that, some of you know me from living in New York or DC, but I am up in Vermont now, so excited to be connecting with you all um, at NEMA. Um, yeah, and so definitions of justice, right? This is a place that we're, I'm probably not gonna tell you things today that are going to be um, taken out of context, anything new for you. Um, and what I'm hoping to share are a couple of different perspectives that we see people kind of talking to um, from around the world as folks think about this, right? And having a sense of the underlying structure that we approach the idea of justice with is really helpful both for ourselves in finding our own ways into doing justice work, um, for reimagining what our work as museum people is as justice work, right? Um, and then also co connecting and uh, working with others who have different conceptions of justice than we do. Okay. Um, I want to just start with one quick quote from a great thinker at Notre Dame. His name's David Hooker. Um, and he said, we have to do not just fruit work and trunk work, but dirt work. Um, one of the things as I listen to people talk about justice around the world, people use a lot of metaphors for justice, right? We often, it's something that is not always the easiest to explain when we try and say to somebody, what is justice, um, right? And we start pulling on all kinds of other words, fairness and equity and this and that, and right? Um, and a lot of times people turn to metaphors, right? Um, and so this is a great one uh, where David Hooker was talking about kind of using this metaphor as a tree, um, right? In, in the context, in this context, in the United States, talking about um, policing and race, uh, he would say, right, it's not just those kind of uh, end result pieces, the fruit, right? And it's not just the basic structures of the tree, it's about kind of culture and what is in the dirt that gets sucked up that makes the tree, that makes the fruit, um, right? And so he was using a tree metaphor. Um, and so we're gonna pause here. We're gonna have more silent reflection, um, which I'm, uh, I'm excited for you to have that silent reflection, um, but I'm also missing, because I now wanna know the answer to each of these. Um, I want you to take 30 seconds. And if you had to explain your concept of justice to somebody, what is the metaphor that you would use? Okay, um, so I'm curious for you to think in terms of metaphors now, right? What's inside of you? How would you explain this to others? All right, so take 30 seconds and think about that.
All right. Hopefully you've done a little bit of thinking about that. And I think right, justice work takes a lot of reflection time, right? trying to understand what our structures are, trying to um, think about them in different ways and ask questions. Because so often um, justice work takes us to intersections of hard choices. Um, and so being able to understand who we are helps us better make choices in that way um, in those moments, helps us be reflective about all those pieces that we need to um, be constantly thinking about, right, about our bias, about our perspective, about our experience, right, and again, share it with others, because justice, as we try and make it actionable in the world, is going to require us to be doing this with other people, right, building a just world, enacting justice um, is always a collaborative effort, um, right. Uh, Alex, did you have something? I saw you come off mute. Oh, sure. Did you want me to share some of the examples from the chat? Yes, if you can find them. I am having trouble. Um, sure. so, so um, please do. Yes, thank you. Kathy talks about something about a spider's web and that we are connected and we all have access to the whole web. Carrie mentions mending cloth. Uh, Chris echoes the spider metaphor. Um, I saw another one from uh, Carrie about uh, not just sharing the cookies, but making sure um, we have ev enough for all to bake. Um, justice allows all boats to rise with the tide that came from Adrian. So those are some of the metaphors that have come through. Nice. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Um, and yes, share where you are. I'm, I'm struggling with the Hoover platform right now. Um, but uh, thank you for doing that and uh, yeah, bringing those in, right? Yeah, so spider webs and cookies and right, all these ways that we try and make sense of what it means to live justly with the planet and with other people. Um, so wanted to do, we're gonna kind of just look at, uh, as a starting point, I wanna look at four different definitions of systems of justice that we often encounter, um, right? Uh, and this is, again, uh, we so often think about systems in our work, right, that individuals matter because we're the ones who create and shape and move systems, but then living in those systems, um, right, they set the scene for all that happens. And so much power gets concentrated and built up um, in those systems. So kind of four structures and systems of justice that we regularly encounter, right? And uh, just as a note, Anybody who spends their life doing justice work or studying any of these is going to be appalled at the, 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 the sparse level of these definitions. Um, but I'm trying to give you a quick access and insight. Each of these has a whole world of thinking behind it. All right, so definition number one, retributive or punitive justice, right? This is what we know so much in the US, right? So there's a quote from Wikipedia. Um, right, always a great source for things. Uh, right, it's actually kind of hard to find people writing about a definition in some ways of what punitive justice is because it's so much a part of where we are and how we live in the U.S. Um, that uh, we often, it's often something that people don't even um, stop to define in terms of what it is as a system. Right, the idea here is that this is typically focused on harm doers. Right? And the idea is that you deliver some degree of harm to the harm doer um, to punish them and to prevent future uh, harm doers. Right? Um, there may be some degree of repair that is given to uh, somebody who was harmed uh, in terms of a fine or something like that. But um, right, typically is very much about uh, being appropriate punishment for harm doers. Right? This is where you see in jail, right? We see fines, you see lawsuits, right? All the stuff that we see in the US system, much of it falls into this category. Okay. Uh, definition number two, probably the second most common form of justice that people talk about in the United States is restorative justice. Um, and this is stuff you'll see schools will be built around the idea of restorative justice. Um, you'll see uh, uh, lots of different communities use this. There are some um, communities as a whole that use, uh, have, try and have restorative justice options within, um, within their justice systems, right? So, hey, if you're in uh, Minnesota and you want to go down a restorative justice path, um, sometimes that's access, uh, accessible to you. All right, so restorative justice kind of takes this idea of victim and offender, right? And it adds in this third piece, 
right, that says, all right, it's not just those people, but there's a whole community that's involved here, right? Um, and so we're not, as we try and make things right in the world, we've got to think not just about the victim, not just about the offender, we've got to think about the relationship between them, and then we've got to think about the relationship to the community as well, right? and how all these pieces are interacting with each other. Um, and so we're trying to make all of those pieces right. Um, and, and restorative justice often involves trying to bring individuals into communication with each other, um, and then making sure that the actions that come out of restorative justice are directed at um, repairing and restoring each of those, right? particularly victim and community. Um, both um, punitive justice and restorative justice uh, operate um, best in a situation in which you are thinking about um, sort of the, the problems of a moment, the problems of the situation are rooted in and caused by an individual, right? So an individual has done something, right? And we need to then sort of go and try and make that right. Um, both of them start to struggle a little bit when you look around and you say, hey, it's not just one individual that's off. We seem to have a pattern here, right? What's going on? Right? And that there is some sort of a larger structure that is shaping the way that people are engaging and experiencing and taking action in the world. And at that point, when you start to say, okay, there's a, right, we are starting to think about systems. Um, there's two other forms of justice that people tend to turn to in thinking about that, um, right? And so one of those is transitional justice, right? Um, and transitional justice is something that people turn to specifically when the scale of, uh, of harm um, it exceeds the capacity for a community's justice system to deal with it, right? The existing courts, the existing um, forms of ways of, uh, of people trying to make things right. Um, right. When that breaks down, this is often where people turn, right? So we're thinking, right, common uh, or famous cases of people turning to transitional justice, right? South Africa, post-apartheid, um, right? But then there's hundreds of other examples of this around the world, large scale and small scale. Um, for the kind of New England Museum community, one of the most familiar ones that you might've run across in the last couple of years um, is uh, based out of Canada and the work that's been happening around the, tr uh, the um, uh, uh, boarding schools there uh, and the truth commissions, which are one aspect of transitional justice uh, that have been done around, uh, about, around the boarding schools, right? So transitional justice, um, we're starting to think about, okay, um, what is the, uh, how are we holding um, perpetrators accountable? So there's still a focus on perpetrators. Um, how are we providing um, uh, reparations to victims? So there's thinking about providing reparations to victims. Um, but then there's also that kind of larger community focus, similar to restorative justice around uh, truth telling. Um, but there's also then uh, systematic shifting and changing, right? So how do we change the systems, whether those are economic, um, educational, police, uh, military, right? Whatever it might have been that caused the uh, or, and supported the, the harm that was done, right? How do we shift those? And for those counting at home, there are five pillars of transitional justice. The fifth that I hadn't mentioned is memorialization, which goes back to that part of how do we help communities and individuals um, make sense of and process and heal um, from, from events, right? So that's transitional justice. And the last one is transformative justice really pretty sim similar to, to, to transitional justice in a number of ways, but you can see it's really rooted in the idea of um, trying to get people and systems back into balance with each other. One of the big differences between transformative and transitional justice um, is that transformative justice eschews all use of um, uh, punitive measures. Uh, transitional justice will use uh, punitive justice as, as a component of it, right? So if you, when you think about that, uh, that is things like uh, war crimes trials, right? So, hey, we're going to take somebody and we're going to take them to The Hague and we're going to put them on trial and 
um, try and hold them accountable in those ways and prison sentences and things may come with that. Um, right, so that's a that's a part of one of the, the of transitional justice, not so much a part of transformative. All right, so here's a brief summary of each of those, right? These four definitions in retributive, punish the perpetrator, restorative, address harm in relations between the perpetrator, victim, and community, um, transitional, support victims and change problematic systems, right? Can include retributive aspects. Um, and transformative, right? Address relationships between individuals with problematic systems that cause the harm does not include retributive aspects. Um, so another kind of conversation and discussion moment uh, okay. that okay. I would love people to turn into. Um, Alex, yeah, are there questions? Yeah, no, I'm so sorry. Uh, I just oh, want right. to make no, that if um, folks raise their hand, I do have the ability to unmute them individually. Yes. Great, yeah, let's do that. Let's have some folks talk. So if anyone's interested in talking, just indicate um, with a raised hand or throw your name in the Whova chat and I will unmute you. All right. While that's happening, um, my question to everybody is kind of looking at these larger systems, right? Ways that people have tried to make sense of who needs to be involved in a conversation, where we start, what, how we identify even what the problem is. Um, I'm curious to ask to, for people to, to um, uh, write in the chat or if you wanna come on and talk about it, right? What kinds of systems do you see operating in your, um, uh, in your communities right now? And what are the conversations that you hear from people as they try and think about new or different forms of justice that they wanna be a part of and live within? So I'm gonna go to Mia. Yeah. Hi, I hope you guys can hear me. Yes. Oh, okay, good. Um, so I was just thinking actually, um, back in the in the past a little bit um i grew up in different school districts across different states um i didn't land in new england till i was you know middle school and seeing how ideas of diversity and ideas of justice and so forth were treated very differently depending on where we were and seeing that there were communities where unfortunately there was um, particularly strong inherent racism or anti-Semitism that crept into elementary schools. I wonder, you know, at, you know, at that young age, having certain ideas about what diversity looks like, what justice looks like, um, and addressing those issues with young children, the importance of that um, from, from such a young age and different kinds of justice uh, as well. Um, exposing them perhaps to what's going on in the news more, what's going on in, in the larger society a little more. I think young kids can actually be trusted with that more than we sometimes um, expect them to. Um, because I've also seen the flip side of how children respond to adults who don't practice um, or encourage justice themselves. So I don't know if that is quite what you were looking for, but those are some of my thoughts. No, that's terrific. Thank you. Um, that's uh, right. Our experiences shape this and we have very different experiences of justice around the country and the systems and the structures and the schools that um, make that happen. Right? We apply it differently in different places and to different people. Yeah. Um, and kids are thinking about this from the start. Right? They are absolutely saying, OK, who do I how do I think about fairness in the world? How do I treat other people? Um, and we're regularly having that conversation. Yeah. Excellent. Um, other folks, I've now got the Whova app working. I'm curious to see what folks are saying. Nice, restorative justice is a part of Deborah's town school system. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? 
this one now. Okay, um, right. These are four systems that we commonly see around the world that people kind of operate out of. Um, they are not the only systems of justice that people operate within. Um, right, we can think about First Nations communities across North America having other systems and conceptions of justice, right? Communities throughout the world um, that have other forms and structures of doing this um, and ways of looking at that. Um, I think about uh, members working in South Sudan and in, and in um, Kenya who use uh, traditional forms of justice in those spaces that try and skew some of the more um, uh, punitive structures that have come in as parts of um, colonialism. So, uh, right, understanding what we're operating out of as a system, what we have in our head, where we see people operating in these different ways um, is helpful in our own work. Right? Uh, and it's important to ask those questions that sort of highlight in all of these around, um, right, who are we paying attention to? How do we start to define problems? How are we asking people to engage and interact with each other as the process of justice unfolds? Okay. Um, the thinking about then, how do we start applying this to our work? Um, and a place we see a lot of historians and museum people get hung up um, is that uh, it's unclear to them how history work or how um, museum work or artwork or science work can be a part of justice movements, right? We might see a little bit of an entry point. We might see some space for it. Um, but making those two things the same is not always immediately apparent to everybody. Um, part of what I would invite everybody to do is to flip the order that we ask that question in, right? So we often think of ourselves as museum people and we say, okay, how can my work become more like justice work, right? I'm a historian. How can I start to support or do a little bit of justice work out of the history work that I already do. I would invite you to flip that conception, right? And say that if we are engaged in education, if we are engaged in caring for our communities around us, right? We are at base doing justice work, right? That is what we are here to do as cultural organizations, as institutions. Um, and so we happen to be using history in a particular moment. We happen to be using um, museums in a particular moment. Um, but I, so I would encourage you to sort of flip that conception in your head a little bit. And then what I would invite you to do is as you look around the world, you're going to see a lot of people are constantly asking that question. Right? I don't have one answer for you to say like, hey, this is exactly how a museum can do this. This is exactly how a museum can do that. Um, right? Because I think there's tons and tons of entry points to this that people are constantly trying to answer. So I'm just going to show you four ways that I have seen people recently talking about how people can become involved in this, how to conceive of um, our work as justice work. Right? These are non-museum examples. Um, I thought about bringing a bunch of museum examples. Um, had I known we were going to do this as a, as without the interaction, maybe I would have. Um, but I actually, I, I want us to think about this from not within our field, but thinking about this um, from elsewhere, because sometimes our field will put up some boundaries. It'll limit our imagination for what we can do. Um, and so thinking about this, how are other people approaching this can help us reimagine our own. So let's go back to a couple of slides here. All right. So four ways I've seen people trying to answer the question of how do we start to participate in justice work and how do we shape that? All right, so from the Albert Einstein uh, Institute, uh, they have a list of 198 methods of nonviolent action. I did not try and fit all 198 onto a slide, um, but they've got them all there and there are more, right? So as people say, okay, what does nonviolent action look like in the world? How do we become engaged? Right? You can see in there, there are some, some conceptions of morals and ethics and justice systems already starting to get baked into um, just the title and the conception of this, right? But that, that just action requires nonviolent action. And that's something that everybody agrees with, right? And there are ways for us to get involved in that. And the way they break it out is into four focus areas. 
nonviolent protest and persuasion, non-cooperation, economic, political, and social, and nonviolent intervention, psychological, physical, economic, political, and social. All right. Check out the whole list to see what it looks like. There's a link there at the bottom. Googling it might be easier than trying to follow the whole HTML trail, right? Um, but as you look around you and you see people starting to say, let's organize, let's mobilize, let's build nonviolent movements, that's people talking about justice work, right? Not a surprise. Right? It's often in the, the title and in the, the conception of what they talk about. But they're also talking about what you as an individual and what you as an institution can do. Right? And so starting to say, hey, what are these ways of providing nonviolent action? Right? Most museum action probably will be nonviolent in some way. And so what are the ways that museums can play a role in supporting these or being actually carrying some of them out? Right? And it's interesting to start to work through that and realize we have a lot more levers to pull than we think. We often go to this place in museums of saying, look, okay, uh, we want to do something. Well, let's do an exhibit about it. Let's do a public program about it. Actually, right, we've got all these other ways. We can be part of persuasion. We can be part of protest. We can be part of non-cooperation. We can be part of a range of kinds of intervention, um, right? And starting to recognize that stuff that we do all the time actually is these other things uh it helps us reconceive of what it is that we do all right way number two when i see people talk about allyship right i often i, I think about i'm seeing people talk about what justice systems should look like and how people are behaving towards each other right because allyship conversations are regularly about systems and structures they are regularly about um, what you do when you cause harm to an individual and to a community and how you make that right, they are steeped and rooted in restorative justice practices, um, right? And they are then thinking about that kind of leveraging up from that restorative work, right, up to that systemic change work as well, right? So when people talk about allyship, right, and as we then think about what does it mean for our institutions to be allies, right, and to be agents and to be accomplices and all the other words that people are moving into as they try and push allies to being active, to be to taking action. Right? Um, right? So when I see people doing ally work, I see them, I see us thinking about trying to define justice work in there too. Right? Third, this is great. I hope many people have seen this already. Um, it's part of a, a larger piece. Lots of folks have tried to um, map um, what the different roles of people in social change movements are. Right? People come up with all kinds of maps. This was uh, uh, a fairly recent one that was going around from Deepa Iyer, um, which name may have pronounced wrong, apologies, but uh, spelling is at the bottom. Um, the uh, right, and I always like circles and wheels, and you'll see in the next one, the next thing's a circle too. Uh, some really great um, conceptions of all the different kinds of roles that need to come together uh, to make a movement work, right? To help people move us towards a state of more justice in the world. Right? There's a couple of things that we tend to highlight, right? We tend to highlight the person who is there at the tip of the spear, like the 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 agitator, the uh, protester, the speaker, the spokesman, the person who makes it to the very front and is there with the cameras at the line, right? And that is only one of the many, many, many roles that need to happen as part of this goes through, right? So as we think about how our work can and already is or could be more, right? Thinking about all of these different roles, that it doesn't just have to mean uh, being the loudest voice in the room, right? That we need those folks, indispensable, and we need all these other people um, to, to make this work, all right? Um, Google this, you'll find it also, uh, all of these are, are open source and openly accessible. Um, great descriptions of what all these pieces are um, and are really helpful as we do all of our work, right? So as we then go back and we look at our history, right? That these things are cyclical um, or, or circular so that as we learn more about our present, we're helping us re-understand our history. But as you then go back and you look at the historical stories you tell, as you look at the historical content you tell, 
right? Um, we often, I used to work at Frederick Douglass National Historic Site. So, right, there's Mr. Douglass, front of the room, leading, talking, brilliant with words, brilliant writer. Um, right, we sort of have that conception of who an activist is. But what about all these other folks, right? The builders, the caregivers, the disruptors, the experimenters, the weavers, the guides. Right? As you look at people living their lives, as we look at the history, do we see them and actually start to understand our history differently? which we can then bring into the present to help people understand their present differently. All right, and the last one, one last circle. This is uh, from one of my favorite thinkers uh, about um, peace work. Uh, this is the, his name's John Paul Lederach. Um, again, may have mispronounced it, um, but uh, love his writing. And this is what he thought about as a bunch of the things that are happening as we try and build peace movements. And so he's really coming from a peace world, which related to justice work, right? They all intersect. Um, but that's his, that's his bent of how do I get folks who are actively in contact, uh, conflict to stop. And so uh, this is how we broke it down, right? Kind of these three internal pieces, right? Structural and institutional change. We've heard that language before. Violence prevention, conflict response and transformation. Right, and then justice and healing, right? words we've been hearing. And again, right, this is somebody grappling with what does this system look like and how do people find their places in it. Right? Um, and so you can see that in this, there's a bunch of words that we've heard, right? restorative and transitional justice. Um, but there's some other stuff. It right? is he's saying, all right, how do we, and he's done work all over the world, right? We also need that trauma healing. We need that humanitarian action. We need to be uh, addressing uh, national and transnational and global threats. Um, thinking about law, advocacy, and solidarity, right? Dialogue, conflict, and resolution, right? So all of these pieces are going on. And uh, this may be overwhelming as you look at it and you're like, oh gosh, that's a lot of things. And there's a lot of colors on here and shapes and, right? And, what I would say is that with all of these, um, we don't have to be all of these things, right? Um, this is not a map of everything that a museum needs to do, right? Or one of our historic sites needs to do, or one of our art sites needs to do, or a science center needs to do. We can't do all of these things, and we're going to be very good at doing most of these things, right? But that's also true of everybody else in the world. There's nobody in the world who looks at this and is like, yep, I'm aces at all of those. Every institution right, is going to look at this, every organization, every individual is going to see massive gaps in what they're capable of. And so what that means to me and for us is that as we look at things like this, it means the places that where there are gaps, that's where we find friends. And the places where we are stars, well, we got to step up and carry that because there might not be other folks who can. Right? And so as we think about finding our way in the world, finding our way into this, re-understanding what we're doing, right? It's not that we necessarily need to stop doing ed programs or we need to stop doing exhibits. It is understanding that when we do an education program, when we do a public program, when we do a hands-on activity, when we do a, a nature walk, when we do, right? Each of those has the opportunity to be about trauma and healing. Right? It has an opportunity to be about bringing people into relationship building that supports nonviolent social change. It has the opportunity to be about dialogue between people. Right? Um, and so it has the opportunity to be about that truth telling that needs to happen as a part of this. Right? And so it's not so much that right, we do have to shift lots of things about museums, right? but we're not leaving all of it behind. We're already doing a bunch of this already. Um, and so it's kind of changing what our starting questions are often to help guide us into doing this. All right, so I'm going to stop there. Um, I ended up talking more than I meant to because, hey, I only had eight slides. Um, so let's pause here and say how folks feeling. Um, Thoughts on your mind, ways this is resonating, things that are confusing or challenging or not settled for you about this, ways you would want to apply this in your own work.
certainly encourage folks to uh, drop questions, comments in the chat, or if you want to raise your hand, uh, we can unmute you to talk. I guess one question I would throw out, Braden, um, is scale. You know, how do you do? You have advice for you know small uh, historical societies and museums versus larger institutions? Um, where good places to start might be. Uh, we were we were just talking about this at. Um, with some of our transitional justice teams. We have a big chunk of folks at the coalition who do transitional justice work around the world. Um, and we were just talking about this this morning that like so often we look at the world and we're like, ah, I wanna change it all. <laughs> and we're like called to and, and, and feel compelled to and feel pushed to. And that is never for anybody an operable starting point, right? And so um, what I would, uh, particularly thinking about small organizations, um, right, the first question in all of this is to find your power, right? You find your people and you find your power. Um, and what I would say is that um, so many of the structures and the forces in the world that exist, um, Right, and the inequitable structures, one of the ways that they survive is they help people misunderstand what their power is and misunderestimate it. And they help institutions um, and they push us into individual silos. And so one of the first steps that you do in any organizing, whether it's yourself or others, right, is find your people and find your power. Um, and recognizing that you've got more than you realize. It's not gonna be, if you set yourself up as like, can my institution change the whole country, change the whole world? Not alone, and that's okay. It's not supposed to be that way. If you could, that would be, that, that's, that means we've gotten into all sorts of other dictatorship spaces if, if you're the one who decides everything. Um, so it's not meant to be that way. Uh, but uh, right, you have that ability to, you, you have connections, you have stories, um, and you have places that are all incredibly powerful. Right? And between those things, connections to people, stories and physical places for people to be in when we're allowed to do that. Um, we have a lot of the ingredients for helping people reimagine the past, reimagine themselves and reimagine the future and also build relationships, um, both with individuals they can meet directly and individuals that they will never meet, communities and places they will never meet that allow them to also develop that moral imagination that fuels and powers change, right? So the scale might not be huge, um, but don't, don't, right? that's, the, that's the easiest thing to tell other people is don't worry about the scale, do the scale that you can manage. Um, and it's always the hardest for every one of us. It's something I fight with every week. You get to the end of your weekend and boy, world isn't fixed yet, I must be a failure at this, right? All my colleagues face it, every one of our partners faces it. We all go through that every week, every day, um, right? Don't worry that the scale's not the hugest. You do what you can where you can. So, great, uh, so building on that, Zach uh, asked a good, great question. Have you seen a punitive model successfully transition to a restorative or transformational justice model? If so, what did that look like? Yeah, I think that's another scale question, um, right? And this is a place where uh, there are people who are going to have much better, um, much better examples. There are people who are like real experts in each of these. Um, uh, I think that w when you think, as you're looking for models of that, don't look at the national level. That's not where that's happening right now. You're going to be looking at the institutional level, right? So what what is it? What happens when a school, right? It was like Mia was talking about before, and that's a really common place of kind of contained communities that people often think through this, um, right? What does it mean, uh, schools that have shifted to that? Um, and I don't know where you are, I, and I, I don't have a great sense of all of the schools that have tried to adopt that across New England. Um, the person I've worked with the most who's done that is actually out in San Francisco, who changed a school out there. Um, but it's about the, uh, that's a really, that would be one place that I would start to look in most communities for where that's happening. Um, the place you're gonna see because of, right, again, about kind of scope and scale is any place you can imagine small contained communities that have the uh, space 
to reimagine what their community process is going to be. Um, so sometimes planned communities of all kinds will do that. Um, schools, universities, uh, places like that are, are where I would look for examples of that. Um, and from friends in San Francisco who have done it, right, positive results. The students are better engaged. Um, people are better able to get along. And you can see folks building the skills and to ask the questions and um, move through experiences in the wider world in uh, positive ways too. So good question. Uh, we've got a couple of folks who are uh, interested in wondering about the idea of an American reconciliation process uh, given the current political moment and is reconciliation the same as justice? Oh, what a good question. Um, yeah, all right. So that is, uh, uh, you know, that's a, you like peek, we're going to crack open that door and like glance behind it and then like say, wow, there's a lot of space out there to talk about things. We're going to close it for the moment. Um, a, a plug for one of my colleagues, Areshi Nadu Silverman, who is our director of transitional justice. She actually just did a webinar talking with some folks about what a transitional justice process in the U.S. would look like. Um, so we can check that out. It should be on our website. Um, the rate. Um, one of the interesting comments that was made in that uh, was uh, one of the panelists talked about how many uh, languages in the world don't have a word for um, reconciliation, and that they might only have a word for justice. So I think there's a lot of different cultural uh, points of view that go into that um, idea of like, is justice and reconciliation the same thing? Right? Um, and what I would uh, encourage people to think about um, is that reconciliation is not something that we can ever dictate to people. It's not something we can ever force on people. Um, and it is something that doesn't come at the start of processes. It's something that comes at the end of processes um, and is itself an ongoing process. Um, and is rather a, not so much a state, but is a set of behaviors that people are adopting and reinforcing towards each other. Um, it also is something that is not, we want to jump really fast. Just as a quick example, you'll hear the South African example was the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Not all true, uh, recon, uh, truth commissions need to also have reconciliatory components. In fact, many of them don't. Right? And the expectation is like, we need to do truth telling first, and then we will be able to start to think about what it means to do um, reconciliation work. Um, so that is a point of actually huge conversation in the field about when and how do you sequence these things and what do you need to be able to start to help people engage in each of those steps. Um, so uh, yeah. Right, it's going to be different in different contexts, but really good question. And um, check out Areshni's webinar as a starting point for that. Um, and I would say, like, let's keep that conversation going forward rather than having one final answer to it. Because, um, yes, that is <laughs> it's a thing the US is uh, facing right now in a big way. Uh, building off of that, Adam mentioned. Um that uh, for museums, especially, there's a, a legacy or an inherent system of injustice upon which we were founded or which have supported our field for many years. Uh, how do we turn that mirror on ourselves uh, in a way that's meaningful? Yeah. Um, so again, another like big, giant, wide door, right? Asking that question is the first step of doing that, right? of being self-reflective. Um, I often think about this in terms of a three-step process that um, Kyra Banks wrote about in the Ford through Ferguson uh, report, where she writes about how um, when people come to face an injustice in the world and try and decide, okay, what am I going to do about this? Right, and there's certainly the option that people do of like, I'm gonna turn away from it, or I'm gonna ignore it, or I'm gonna reinforce it, um, right? Those are all options out there. We see people adopt them all the time. Uh, but if you choose to try and change it, right, and change it for the better, uh, there's kind of a three-step piece that we go through with that, right? Where the first is awareness, right? And so it's building that process of awareness 
um, or, or building a, an understanding of awareness and like, what is this thing, right? Where, where do I see it? Am I aware of it? Am I recognizing it as it's happening? Am I seeing it play out in, in the spaces where I am, right? So that's the first piece. The second piece is understanding. Right, so now do I understand where this thing came from and how it's operating on a regular basis? Right, so not just I see it, but do I get what's happening here? What are the consequences of it and what are the root causes of it? Right? And once you've done those two things, then you start to think about transformation. Right? How do I transform this from what it is into uh, something else? The thing that often happens um, is that we want to move from the first glimmers of awareness straight to the end results of transformation. Right? And that's, we can't do it. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't work or we don't, we don't do it in ways that actually transform um, in, in healthy, positive ways. Um, right? It takes a little bit of time uh, of working out awareness, of working on understanding to let us uh, get to transformation. Now we can support others who are doing that work um, a little bit faster, right? We can follow somebody else's lead who's ready to move a little bit quicker. Um, but that's what I would think about, about saying, where is this institution and which step of that process are we at? And let's make sure that we, we do each step so that, but keep us moving along the path. Thanks, Braden. I have to end this uh, at 2.30, but I've got one more uh, question. Aaron mentions, um, looking into the green dot bystander training as a resource. But Wendy wants to know, um, from the perspective of a, of a science museum, how do you sort of navigate dealing with, uh, you know, truth and truth telling um, when there are people who reject the science? Mm, yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, uh, what I would say is, uh, we need our scientists and our cultural organizations to be in better conversation, right? Because um, our scientists have super important things to share with us about how to understand our world, how to make sense of it, how to what we need to be aware of, how we're understanding that, right? And as we make choices about transformation, where we're going, right? But when somebody disagrees with a scientific fact, it's not usually because they're operating out of forensic scientific truth. Right? They're usually operating out of some kind of personal or social truth. Um, and I'm drawing on uh, something called the Four Truths that comes from the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which we can talk about more another day. As I think through those, um, folks who have hung out with us before, you're like, oh, he talks about that a bunch. <laughs> um, right? Those are cultural conversations. When somebody chooses to listen to facts or not, when somebody, right, a, a, a scientific finding or not, when somebody chooses um, right, who they're going to find as experts, those are cultural conversations, right? Those are human choices that come out of the societies and cultures that we're a part of. Um, and so that what that means for science organizations is being willing to have those cultural conversations around the scientific facts, right? Because um, if we're not engaged in that cultural understanding, we can just keep throwing all of the information at people, going to bounce off. Um, it's about creating cultural spaces that get people to be a little bit more open to listening to um, other personal truths, other social truths, and, and other forensic truths. Um, so a super long uh, conversation to have about that, but I think that's where, um, that's where I would start to think about that uh, it, more fact isn't always going to solve that. We got to keep it there. We got to keep that forefronted. Um, but uh, recognizing that that's only going to take us so far if somebody's made not a fact-based conversation, but a cultural-based um, decision. So, yeah. Maybe a good place to, to close out is yeah. to circle back to Chris's question. And he was sort of asking, um, you know, when there's so much animosity and digging in around these perspectives and, you know, folks are really feeling like they have to choose a side in these cultural conversations, how do you move through uh, animosity towards understanding? Oh, um, gosh, uh, we've got 60 seconds, so, <laughs> um, right, uh, less than that, probably. Um, if I knew how to do that perfectly every time, the world would look different than it does, right? But I think what we, as we think about the models that we follow, right, a lot of it is about trying to build relationships between people, 
right? That relationships allow us to do a whole bunch of other things. And as Kaylee Bryan Greenwell always says, like we move at the speed of trust. So a lot of what we're doing is we're trying to spend time building trust between people. And that means not starting necessarily at the biggest uh, social truth conversations. That means starting at those basic personal truth conversations, right? Like who taught you about justice? Where does that come from? If we can start to understand that, then we start to be able to have the next conversation, right? And if we can have that, then we can have the next conversation. We're not gonna get to the final piece every time. And that's really hard when we feel like we are facing existential moments. Um, it's one of the challenges of this, that we are engaged in generational work at a moment where we feel like our, um, our success needs to come in uh, times measured in months, weeks, and days, right? And hours and minutes. Um, and so it's a hard mix to work in, at both of those. Um, but we got to keep that generational work going at the same time that we fight um, those like minute to minute battles too. So yeah. Sounds like a, a great uh, call to action to leave off on. Thank you so much, Brayden, for All taking right. time to share. Thanks with everybody for hanging out. Um, anytime the coalition or myself can be of help, um, please reach out. We always love to talk and connect and see where else we can go. Thanks everyone, be well, enjoy the conference. Bye all. Thanks so much.